Ha, we're live, everybody. Good evening, all of you have uh, welcome who are here, who've come from various different platforms to this uh, dinner table seminar this evening. Um, it's going to be an interesting one. The title of the uh, of, of this evening's discussion is the writer, whistleblower, or canary in the gold mine, or testifier. Um, we're going to be serving a lot of meat and potatoes here tonight. It's a heavy diet. Uh, there might, I don't think there's any pudding for anyone. Uh, there might be some vegetarian uh, side dishes, but uh, we'll see if, if there are any of those. It's pretty heavy going. I'd like to just initially introduce all my guests who I'm so pleased to be here. I'm very pleased all of them are here. I'm your host for this evening, Marianne Tan. Um, and I'm going to sort of go around. I'll start with Mandy. Mandy Wiener, welcome. Thank you very much. You're an author of, of uh, several books. Uh, the last latest one being The Whistleblower, Ministry of Crime, Brett Kevill. You're one of the, the finest sort of uh, chroniclers, I suppose, of, 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 of the South African criminal landscape in the last, uh, oh, you know, as long as we've been around. And I'd like to welcome you very much this evening for being here. Thank you. Um, Athol, Athol Williams, our, uh, our whistleblower. I met Athol uh, a while back in Cape Town in the middle of, of, of his troubles. Athol is a, uh, an extraordinary, he's a, he's a poet and a moral philosopher and a whistleblower and um, uh, worked for Bain and Company uh, at a specific time. If people remember, Bain and Company were brought in to restructure SARS. Um, and uh, I, I find Athol's relationship with Bain and Company very interesting. He's, he's been a part of the company for a very long time. So, you know, his actions to whistleblow uh, were more than just, uh, you know, I think the company had, had nurtured you and had seen your talent and had, had, had really helped you succeed in your life. So, you know, it's especially difficult in, in, in those circumstances. Um, we'll go through, you know, Athol will tell you his story in, in, in what happened to him. Uh, Temba Maseko, all of us sort of know, and uh, she's been away for a while, former uh, uh, government spokesperson or uh, 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 who whistle blew, um, I think, you know, started was in the struggle in the, at the age of 13. As you know, most black South Africans are born, were born into the struggle. So when they say at the age of 13, I'm sure it went back before then. Um, uh, very much committed to, to South Africa democracy and a new government. And in 2010, um, Demba was called by, by the Gupta family and asked if uh, he and requested to move all the advertising, government advertising to the Gupta newspapers. And in fact, the former president also called Demba Maseko, which might, must have been incredibly scary when you get a call from someone and you're working for that government and, and they order you to do things. It's extremely difficult to go against that. And and I'd like to know what it was, I'll, and we'll explore that, that Timber drew on to be able to stand up to, uh, I suppose, the very top, very apex of government. Brent Beersman has been around for a very long time, a, a, an editor at Ground Up, which does phenomenal work, I think, uh, uh, growing young writers, growing young journalists, growing fearless young journalists in a space which is about the ground up, which is what I think this democracy is becoming. Um, uh, an essayist and a writer of fiction and poetry as well. So we've got these very talented people here and Brent's latest book, which I have a copy of here, is called Rattling the Cage, which is a selection of essays, um, Brent, uh, Brett's um, uh, you know, thoughts and, 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 and criticisms of the last uh, sort of 25 or years of, of, of democratic South Africa. And there's some very important points in this book. And I love how you've revisited Mandela and looked at the legacy. So I would advise everyone to please get it and read it because it will add layering and nuance uh, to our understanding of this very difficult place we live in. And um, uh, I was just gonna say, being amongst all of you, uh, we have to just reassure everybody that there are many good, competent, wonderful people in South Africa who would like things to be better. And this is, and you're part of that. Mandy, if you, if you can just unmute yourself, I'd like to begin with you. You began with the book, uh, The Whistleblowers, um, and this entire sort of session is about the value of a whistleblower. And we know not all the whistleblowers are always necessarily motivated uh, by altruistic, through altruistic reasons that might be self-interest, but it doesn't matter because the end result is different. Um, tell us a little bit about your interest in whistleblowers and at this particular time and your book and um, uh, your, yeah, what, what, how you came to know that this was something we had to look at at this point. Thank you so much, Mariana, and thank you to, to everyone who has logged in and who's spending uh, your evening with us. This is such an important conversation and something I feel so strongly about. Um, the evolution of, of the whistleblowers was a conversation with one particular whistleblower, 
who I met several times and wanted to do a book and ultimately that book did not happen. Um, but I realized through this conversation how, how important the contribution is from whistleblowers, the experience that they go through. And I thought, well, I think that we really need to shine a spotlight uh, on, on whistleblowers and their experiences and, and, and what they go through, their, their lived experiences. So I set about uh, finding whistleblowers and speaking to them. Um, my biggest regret is that I didn't include more. Uh, Ethel and Timber, both of you, I, I have a huge remorse about that. Um, but the thing is, there are so many whistleblowers whistleblowers in South Africa and if you look at the State Capture uh, Commission, if you look at, at Zondo, um, you know, you just see there how many whistleblowers have, have come forward. And I, I do interrogate the definition of the term whistleblower and the legislation in South Africa around whistleblowing. And as you say, Marianne, the, the definition is actually quite, quite finite, but mine is much more broad. I believe there is a spectrum of, of whistleblower. I believe that there are some whistleblowers who are, who are driven by altruistic motives, who do it because they are just compelled to do the right thing. They cannot live with themselves if they see something wrong happening. Um, they, you know, It is black or white for them. Somewhere in the middle, you've got people who see something that is wrong, they realize that if they don't speak up, they will become complicit. And that's why they are the unintended or the accidental whistleblowers. And then at the far end of the spectrum, you've got whistleblowers who are completely driven by self-interest, by self-preservation. And my argument is they remain whistleblowers and we still need them. And, and we need insiders to come forward and tell us about the inner workings of organized crime or state capture if we are going to truly get to the bottom of it. And regardless of their complicity, they, they still help us understand what was going on and they remain whistleblowers. Um, and that's why I, I felt that we needed to, to highlight this in the experience and, and, and just the fact that whistleblowers are not truly appreciated in South Africa. Right, Mandy, that's a very good summing up of, of um of why it is so important. I'm very pleased that there were so many whistleblowers in South Africa, a country which, which is extremely violent and has enormous challenges and big, very big power struggles within the political party. Um, and, and that's incredibly heartening. And uh, I, I want to just use this point to sort of segue into you, Ethel, if, if Mandy, if you, if you could just mute yourself. Um, Ethel, I, I, your choice as a whistleblower, just give us a bit of background about how you found yourself becoming one. And I also would like you to just tell us your relationship with Bain, because I think that relationship um, as a young black man in South Africa and your first interaction with them and how hard it must have been for you to turn against them at that point. If you could just fill mm -hmm. us in a little bit about that and we'll talk later about Bain itself. Yeah, and uh, I avoid that term um turned against them because i turn towards the truth not against anyone but i i i know the context in which you mention it um so just the second part of your question marianne in terms of my relation with bain i joined bain in the global head office in boston in 1995 as an intern so i'd left south africa in 1994 uh after after a few years you know i was one of the first black mechanical engineers in the country and I had a horror time working in the mining industry, in the engineering industry. You can imagine Boxburg and, and Bronco Spreit and um, Krugersdorp were not friendly places to a black South African back then. Uh, I'm not sure how much better it is today. But I then went to the, to the US to study and that's where I met Bain. Um, and it really was a ch complete change of fortune. Whereas in South Africa, I was trying to get heard or get seen because no one was interested in what I had to say. Um, I arrived at this, this amazing company that you know, paid me for my internship, 10 week internship, um, an order of magnitude more than I was earning um, for an entire year in South Africa um, in the global head office, just doing amazing work. Um, so much so that they then decided to um, pay for my, my the second year of my studies, which I was doing an MBA at MIT, and then offered me upfront a, a, a job offer even before I finished my studies. Um, to join them as a consultant in Boston uh, with sign and bonus and everything. So for me, it went from being a nobody, being ignored, being um, um, denigrated in South Africa to going to this place where um, I was valued and really felt valued and an amazing organization with amazing people. And financially, I went from rags to riches, I mean, literally, um, right in terms of what I was being paid. So that's 1995, at the age of 25, um, and I worked with Bain over the, the next 25 years on and off. I left a few times, went back a few times, but built this amazing relationship where there was trust, where there was, uh, no, I 
consider most of the Bain senior people my mentors. These are the people who who helped me grow as a business person. Um, and I would, you know, I moved from 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 the US to London, worked a few years, went back to Bain again, and we, we stayed in touch. Even the years in South Africa where I wasn't at Bain, I was often called upon. Um, I did training for them. I spoke at recruiting events because I love this place. So, you know, when you've got a 25-year relationship with an organization who's given you so much as, as, as Bain's given me and that you really thrived at, you, you form a close relationship. So when, when I got called, so coming back to kind of just the whistleblower story then, when I got in touch with Bain in 2018, which is when the story broke with SARS, so people might, might recall Bain was called into SARS um, to do this restructuring, which allegations are that that caused major damage at SARS and, and it's not going to affect on our, on our economy and our society. Um, I had been developing expertise as a, as a moral philosopher, as a social philosopher around reparations. So whether nations, groups, companies do things wrong or harmful things, what is the process and the right thing to do to make reparations? So when I heard about Bain's involvement with SARS, um, it, it it presented a great opportunity for me as an academic to actually bring some of those ideas to fruition. And so that's how I got involved. So I got involved with Bain on a contractual basis, then on a part-time employment basis to help them think through under the assumption that these were good people, that they wanted to do the right thing, and all they needed was guidance on how to make amends in South Africa. Um, okay. Sadly for me, what then turned out was that um, it appeared there wasn't good intentions or entirely good intentions to actually do the right thing. Okay, we're going to get into that a bit a bit, a bit later. I'd like us to get into the detail of that. Yeah. Um, Temba, I just wanted to move on to you at this point, if you could unmute yourself. Um, your, uh, I, th I think you might still be muted, uh, Temba. There we go. Uh, Temba, hi, welcome. I, um, your position is slightly different. You find yourself working within a government as a spokesperson for government, a very tricky, tricky job where you need to hold a sort of very professional line about what's happening behind the scenes. You know quite a lot as someone in the party, as someone as a spokesperson for government. Um, and, and, and it sometimes is at odds with one's, you know, you, you know, you have to toe lines, there are ways things are done, uh, but one can also bring oneself to any job where there are parameters to it. Um, tell us a little bit about your experience uh, as a government spokesperson and then, you know, what happened uh, and, and your decision to, to fight back because it's, it, it, it was a hell of a decision at the time. Uh, thank you, Marian, and good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for the invitation. Um, basically, I was, I mean, I consider myself as a child of the struggle. Um, I was part of a generation of activists who went into government with a view to actually make things better for South Africans. So I'm a civil servant at heart and I went into government with a view to actually making a difference. What, what happened at GCS is that after working for so many years in that, in that portfolio, I then got a request from RJ Gupta in particular who said he wanted to have a meeting with me. I delayed because I wasn't sure and there were already allegations in the media that he was not up to too much good. And then I eventually agreed to meet him because I thought, you know, I must get him off my back. I must just hear what story he wanted to share with me. And as I was leaving my building, literally within minutes of driving out of the building, I then get a call from President Zuma who says, there are these Gupta boys who want to meet you, uh, please help them. And, and I was actually quite shocked uh, by that call because he had never, after being with him for a couple of months, he had actually never made a direct call to me. So I found the call to be strange, but nonetheless, uh, I started wondering why and how could the president call me about the meeting? And I told him, listen, I'm on my way to a meeting with the Gupta. So I started wondering, did they call him to call me to make sure that they put pressure on me or make it clear to me that in fact, they were connected to, to the president. I was tempted not to go to the meeting, but I, would, I consider that to be open defiance of the, of the president. And I decided to go to the meeting. And I get to the meeting, Ajay Gupta, after a very brief introduction, he just simply says, uh, listen, we know that GCS is in control of 600 million rands of advertising budget, and we want that budget to be allocated uh, uh, to the company that was set, setting up, which was the, the New Age newspaper. So in that conversation, I say, listen, 
that's not how things work here. Firstly, GCIS is not sitting on a 600 million rands budget. The budget is sitting in different departments. So if we run a campaign, we go to departments, get money, and then do a media campaign on behalf of government departments. And he simply said, I'm not interested in that. That's not how things are going to work. From now onwards, you go to each individual department, tell them to transfer all their budget to you, and that is to me, and then I must transfer that money to him. And I said, listen, this is how, that's not how things work in government. And he said, listen, if there's a minister who's not cooperating with you or refuses to transfer the budget to you, uh, let me know, I'll sort them out. I'll summon them to my house. The meeting took place at his house in Southern Wealth. And he said, um, I'll summon them to this house and I'll make sure that they transfer the money to you. And I simply walked out of the meeting because I just thought this was totally unacceptable in my view for somebody who's not in government to give me an instruction of that nature uh, and even tell me that he will sort out my principals, my ministers. And I found that to be totally unacceptable. And I just ignored the issue and I, I went on with my back to my office with my work. Subsequently, he then calls me and says, listen, or one of his people calls me and says the meeting is taking place, uh, or they want a meeting on a Monday, he calls me on a Friday evening. And I simply say, listen, you can't call me on a Friday demanding a meeting, call me on Monday and uh, I'll, I'll set up a meeting with you to discuss what, what you want to talk to me about. And then the, meet, the call ended abruptly because I just found it too unacceptable for somebody to demand a meeting in a specific time. A few minutes later, Ajay Gupta calls me and says, listen, my people tell me we are being difficult. So the meeting is not gonna happen on Monday. It will happen tomorrow, which is a Saturday. And I told him where to get off basically. And a few weeks later, um, I mean, the president has never said any, did not say anything to me about this incident. Then a few weeks later, if not a, a month or so, I then get a, a call from my then minister Minister Collins Chabane, who's now late, who says he's received a call from President Zuma, who says he's out of the country and by the time he returns to South Africa, I must be out of the GCIS job. Importantly, the important detail that I left out was that at the end of my conversation with Ajay Gupta, when I told him where to get off, he told me that he'll report me to my superiors who'll sort me out because I'm being difficult and he will make sure that they replace me with somebody who's gonna be more cooperative with them. And that was the end of the story. So the meeting with Chavani happens and I'm told that the president wants me to go. Chavani says, listen, he'll try and find a job for me. He'll talk to his colleagues in cabinet. And the a cabinet meeting happens two days later. And while sitting in the meeting, I then get information that uh, there's a story in the media running to say I've been fired. I go to Chabani, Chabani checks with Zuma, and Zuma confirms that uh, I have actually been fired from GCIS. And Chabani had to make an announcement at that cabinet meeting that uh, I'll be leaving government. And he decided to place me in the Department of Public Service and Administ Administration, DPSA. And unfortunately for Chabani and I, the minister of DPSA was not at the meeting. But I had to make the announcement that I was, I was now his DG. And I called him and said, Minister, you know, this is what has happened in, in cabinet. I'm going to be making an announcement. I'm making a courtesy call to you to tell you that, in fact, I'm your new DG. He was totally flabbergasted because he said, how could such an appointment be made without consulting him? And that was the end of my public service career because when I went to DPSA, after about three or four months, it became very clear that I was unwelcome. Uh, I was not introduced to staff. Uh, I was not invited to key meetings with the, the management team. And I decided that in fact, this was not for me. I can never sit in an office and just become a clerk. So I decided to, to leave the public service. So in short, that was the, the yeah. story. But an agonizing decision because here you have a career that you've, that you've be dedicated your life to a party and a struggle you've ded dedicated your life to. But uh, it must have had such a huge impact on you being asked directly by someone who had no involvement with the ANC supposedly to be issuing orders that, um, because you know, we've had issues in government before around, but this, this, this broke, this broke uh, uh, the trust you had and, and, and 
who you were, I suppose. It did, Marin, but at that stage, I mean, I did not realize that there was a bigger project, state capture project unfolding in front of our eyes. I thought I was being victimized as somebody who had refused to comply with Zuma's instruction. It only dawned on me later on that, in fact, this was the case. And by refusing to cooperate with the Guptas, it was very clear that I was defying the most powerful politician in the country, Zuma who was president of the ANC and the country. And, and I realized that in fact, I was not gonna have a, a good spell in the public service. But the biggest shock was that when I left the public service and then life just changed for me. You know, you, your calls don't get returned, you can't get a job, you can't basically do anything. You're just seen as the enemy of the state. And that's what the book goes into detail about the risks. Right. It's cold out there. It's cold outside the ANC. Absolutely. That's what they let you know. Um, I think, you know, I'd like to return to uh, to more of the story a bit later on, because the president so far, as far as I can work out at Zondo, has denied any allegation where he has been personally in the room or involved or there. And your testimony is one of the strongest ones because the president called you personally. And in many of the other instances, he denies any involvement. So, you know, you're directly in, in conflict with, with President Zuma or former President Zuma. Um, Brent, if I, if I can move to, to you, um, uh, your interest and engagement as a writer and as a journalist overlaps these, uh, these, these, this question, you know, so um, was, uh, you know, is Athol and, and, and Temba, are they canaries in the gold mine? And I don't know if people understand that phrase because it used to mean in the old days when miners would be uh, mining and uh, they would take a canary down in a cage with them because if the canary died, it meant that the, uh, they were running out of air or that there was some sort of toxic or what, whatever would threaten the, the miners to underground, they would take this canary in the cage. And if the canary died, then they knew there's trouble coming. So that was just the, uh, uh, just, to contextualize that. Um, but you work as a journalist, you've worked with whistleblowers at Ground Up uh, who come to the publication, work with other journalists, you've written books. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll quote your, your um, very important paragraph later on about media freedom and the ability to do our jobs. Because ultimately what people should remember is that everybody here, including the journalists, are doing our jobs in a constitutional democracy. They, you know, they, nobody is doing anything illegal here. No one's amassing money. No one is, uh, you know, exporting things. Nobody's doing anything. We're just trying to make a society work and make it a society of laws. Um, your perspective is varied, uh, but your latest book um, in relation to whistleblowers. Have you, you know, what are your thoughts on their role? Uh, are they testifiers? Are they canaries in the gold mine, or are they none of those things? Are they just something, you know? Um, uh, that we, we naturally all have, where people do, there are good people somewhere who just won't tolerate something they understand is to be massively fraudulent or wrong or corrupt. No, well, I'm, I'm relieved to say that I, I do not have a story to tell like Athel and Temba, um, and my enormous admiration and great respect uh, for them, and also for you, Marianne, and, and for Mandy, uh, and the work that you, that you do. Um, now, I personally have never had death threats, but I know other people in this room have. Um, of course, we are the canary. Just to go back to that canary, you know, the, the writers at the moment, and especially with climate change, we really are the canaries uh, in the cage. I mean, we're sitting there shouting methane, methane, and uh, everybody's waiting for us to drop dead in our cages, as we were expected to do. But, but writers have always held up the mirror to society, and, uh, you know, and, and Caliban has always wanted to see his face in that mirror. Um, and that's, you know, that's part of the, the complexity of the issue, which I, which I go into in the book. And that is that you have the whistleblowers and, and, and we, can, we can shout from the rooftops and we can do a lot of investigative journalism and expose things, but we are not always thanked for that. And we're actually not always thanked for that by the public either. The public seems to sometimes uh, believe, attack the media for exposing the truth about the people that they happen to vote for and, 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 and very much admire. So it's, 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 it's a difficult position that we sit, we, we, we sit in. Um, and there's a kind of a presumption that, uh, you know, media freedom and its ability to change things presumes that people are interested in the truth. But I think human beings have a very complicated relationship with the truth. And it's, because, I mean, the most obvious example in recent times has obviously been the United States. Um, 
And uh, but but on your question of whistleblowers, um, and I and I've talked to Mandy about this before as well when her book came out. Um, absolutely essential for society, um, and I agree with her. And as long as we have people. I think we're frozen on us. Um, I'm going to just quickly move through to you, Mandy, while we wait for uh, Brent, you're back. Sorry, there you go. So, so whistleblowers, yes. Yes, yeah, so I would just say that, yes, the whistleblowers are absolutely essential, and it really depends. Uh, they, they need to be supported, and they need to know that the journalists are there to. Exactly. I think it also, um, you know, when we as journalists are targeted, often people think it's personal that it's uh, if somebody breaks into your home and takes your stuff, people think it's about the journalist. It's not about the journalist. It's about the people who break in and who are wanting to know who is informing the journalists. And we are doing our jobs. I mean, whatever information, I'll take information from anybody and I'll need them anywhere, but I'll have to check that information. So uh, th there's this sort of uh, sense that, uh, you know, somehow we're thwarting a project and that we're in the way and you must kill the messenger in a sense. Mandy, I just wanted to come to you at this point before I move back again to, to, to Athol and, and Temba. Uh, around questions, you know, you, you pointed out to me earlier on, um, you have a whistleblower from Prasa working at security a, a week or two ago, uh, surviving an assassination attempt in Gauteng before he appears at the Zonda, and Judge Zonda being extremely, uh, 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 made a grave statement about how this is, should not be tolerated in a constitutional democracy in a law-abiding country, and that, that you know, condemned it in the strongest, strongest words ever. Um, does that have a chilling effect when you start finding whistleblowers are, are targeted or killed or... Uh, you know, their families targeted. Have, have we had a lot of that um, that you found with mm. the people you've interviewed? Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at this incident that happened with uh, this anonymous whistleblower um, witness at the Zondo Commission, uh, witness number one, there's witness number one, there's witness number three, who will come forward to testify about uh, how Brian Molefe um, and Anosh Singh had gone to Saxon World and collected cash. And then you've got an attempted uh, shooting of one of these witnesses while they were driving in Southern Joburg eight times somebody shot at him. Uh, and quite evidently that is linked to the Zondo Commission and to his testimony there. And Zondo is saying that he is very concerned that it will be a deterrent, and that's why law enforcement needs to, to act against it. And I do believe that it could be a deterrent, that people won't want to come forward. And this was one of my biggest concerns when, when writing my book, was that I, would, I was so worried that people would read it and would think, well, there's no way in hell I'm doing that, because look at how it ends for everyone. Um, it, it's pretty dire, the, the repercussions for whistleblowers in South Africa. They end up being pushed to the fringes of society, as Timber was saying. Uh, it's, many of them land up unemployed. They're unemployable. They wear the scarlet letter W. Nobody wants to touch them. They're cheated as impimpies or pariahs, um, whereas the opposite should be happening. They should be celebrated. They should be given national orders. They should be employed on boards as ethics officers. Um, and I think that's why so many whistleblowers have come before Zonda. We've seen Cynthia Simple, we've seen Suzanne Daniels, we've seen Bianca Goodson, um, we've seen various people come to Zonda and say, please, Mosino Matepo made this, this, this plea to Zonda saying, please, you've got to change something. And I do think that Zonda is in a unique position where he can make recommendations. And he's told these various whistleblowers that he will be looking at the legislation in South Africa and he will be making recommendations with his, his investigators and his evidence leaders because we need to change the law. We've got to change the legislation in South Africa. But more than that, we need to have a societal revolution about how we treat whistleblowers. And I do think that Zondo can really have a, a huge impact in that. Mandy, can you just run us through what the law is that, uh, what exists, what, what uh, protection is there? Uh, we do know that, that, you know, South African witness protection is notoriously unreliable and very difficult for witnesses uh, because our, our, our law enforcement system is so tenuous and so threadbare, you know, protecting witnesses properly, putting the resources in because you know you want to win a case is, 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 is difficult. But, you know, what, what, what is there? Uh, so there's a few... That, yeah, there's a few different pieces of legislation, the primary one being the um, Protective Disclosures Act, uh, the PDA, which came into effect in 2000, it was amended in 2017, but all the research and every whistleblower I spoke to said that it's very good in theory, it doesn't work in practice, it's very much a labour law, it, it really is ineffective. 
In fact, there was research that came out last week, a global study that was done by the International Bar Association and the Global Accountability Project, which looked at the various pieces of legislation around the world when it comes to, to whistleblowing. And South Africa's uh, legislation, when it was introduced, was only the third country in the world to have whistleblowing legislation. But now it's become a dinosaur. We've only hit five of the 20 markers that they looked at. So it's a huge problem. It just doesn't work. And we need to change it. And there's lots of options that we could look at. Um, you know, I think that Zonda's evidence leaders could just look at, at that report and at the 20 markers that they looked at. Uh, we could look at the US where we do something like the False Claims Act, for example, where people are financially remunerated. Uh, we could look at what happens in, in Holland with a whistleblower house, which is like a chapter nine organization that is independent of government, but is funded by government, which offers psychological support, financial support, legal support. Um, and, and the big issue, as you say, often is security. So many of these whistleblowers are not protected. And then you look at, at, at an example like Tabiso Zulu, who's a whistleblower in KwaZulu-Natal, he's been shot. Um, he, he's on the run, he's in hiding, and he had to go to court to force the police minister to give him protection. And the only protection he could get was going into the witness protection program, which is not practical. He has to give up his life and give up his identity and go live under some, you know, pseudonym somewhere, and he only lasted a week. So we need to find a way to be able to better protect whistleblowers, because we need to encourage people to come forward. The only way that we'll encourage people to come forward is if they will be protected, and they will be rewarded, and they will be celebrated. Otherwise, why would you do it? And also for people to understand that the work that, that journalists do is, and uh, most of us, and the work that whistleblowers do is on behalf of, of, of the citizens of South Africa. It's, it, it's not part of a faction. It's not, it's, it, it might have been to start off with, but in the end, as you see with Zonda, he strips away all the meandos, so to speak, and we get to the facts. Um, that's very important. I'd like to then ask Athol and move on to Timber then and back to, to Brent. Athol, your feelings about making the decision. So you get, you get brought back to South Africa. Bain realizes they've done something at SARS that is not necessarily going to result in a good end for them. They bring you to South Africa to look at uh, what happens, to do some sort of, uh, you know, uh, I suppose, damage control or, or whatever. Um, I'd like to sort of keep to what Mandy was saying earlier on, because the fear of, 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 of when you discover, as Temba did, he got a phone call. Um, but, you know, you came back to South Africa. Tell us a bit about what you were tasked to do, because by then already we had, uh, there were many reports about Bain, um, changing the systems at, at, at SARS, which, which was a major uh, uh, key uh, institution that needed to be captured. And there were huge battles that happened there around. We know many, Pravin Gordon, uh, Tomoyani, and uh, uh, Ivan Pile and various others that totally decimated that, uh, that institution. Um, if you could just fill us in on that. Um, so, Marianne, I, I need to be careful what I say, um, as okay. all whistleblowers do, but I'm testifying before the Zonda Commission next week. Um, so I, I will try and avoid um, compromising okay. that. Absolutely, um, understand. That's okay. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I look at the decision to the. Dis Firstly, when I blew the whistle, I did not declare or claim that Bain had been involved in any state capture or any corruption. What I did say was, I suspect that Bain is hiding something. Um, now, now, for me, that was enough of a worry that said, well, I, I can't be part of this organization if they are, in my mind, or my view, hiding information that's relevant to our country's pursuit of truth and justice. When I engaged Bain, um, Marianne, I made it very, very clear in an email um, what I called a, a hierarchy of interest. I said to them, guys, I will engage, I will help as best I can, but understand my hierarchy of interest. It was what's good for South Africa first, what's good for Athol second, what's good for Bain third. And what I meant by that was not that I was out to harm Bain or, or, or ignore Athol's interests. When there's a conflict uh, around a decision, around a way forward, around an action, I was going to place the interest of South Africa first. So that was the mindset in which I went into this. Um, and I think when whistleblowers think, whether implicitly or explicitly, think about blowing the whistle or not, I think you're trading off the cost to you of blowing the whistle and 
the harm you see or the danger you see or the harm being caused. And for me, I, I paid little attention to the cost to me, mainly because I underestimated it completely. Um, I absolutely did not foresee the harm I would suffer by being a whistleblower. Um, and so that part of the equation, I placed zero value on. So I thought, there's been no harm to me. I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to go public. Um, I'm going to speak to the authorities, and everyone's going to be welcoming what I've got to say. Um, and that was completely wrong. Because linked to what all the others have said already, I discovered that actually no one celebrates what you've done. Um, and this is shocking. I mean, this is shocking to me that I, not a single law firm, although the big, the big law firms in this country would represent me. Um, not a single one of the big names. Those are contacted for pro bono help or paid help said no, no, no. based on the people you implicate. Now, I implicate 39 individuals as ends. Based on those you implicate, that's too messy for us. We don't go near it. So think of all the big name law firms, all of them. And they said that straight, straight smaller, out to you. There's too many big names here. Would help. But yeah, in yeah. eight months, I, for, for 18 months, I worked without legal representation, um, compiled my affidavit, which ran into 700 pages, without any legal help. Um, so, so that's one aspect. So the anxiety that created and still holds today is, I have no idea what legal risks are embedded in my affidavit because I wrote it by myself. I sat there as an individual who's writing it. So that's the one. I think this idea, people often ask me, did you get death threats? As if that's the only measure of the cost whistleblowers face. And, and I haven't had any death threats. I think the cost is the perceived risk you face, right? So I know the great extent Bain and others went and still are going to block my testimony. I know the legal and financial threats Bain have made. I know all the attempts to get my, 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 my testimony not to happen. So in my mind, if someone will go to that extent to keep me quiet, what stops them from just the next logical step? So for me, there's always the perceived danger of, of, of speaking out. And like I said, for me, the danger came afterwards. The mental health problems, the physical problems. You know, I had a molar, one of my teeth shattered, not, not from grinding, but from clenching. The whole tooth shattered, they need to be rebuilt. Um, and so when you then speak up, and I've spoken up at conferences where I've said, people, I need help, right? Um, I was at a conference where, where um, Mervyn King had invited me to speak. Not a single person came and said, how can we help? Now, I think this is an important question for us, right? Because Mandy was saying uh, whistleblowers should be on ethics committees, for example, on boards, um, et cetera. We've got to ask ourselves as a society, why do we ostracize whistleblowers? We know it's a fact, but the why is interesting. Because if we in South Africa, all our companies have got so many skeletons to hide, we don't want honest people around, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so for me, that's the explanation. The explanation isn't that we think that these whistleblowers are bad people, is we as a country harbor and celebrate this unethical behavior, that these whistleblowers have shown a propensity to raise the alarm. We don't want them near us. Well, in your case, it's also you, you're dealing with the professional industry. I mean, I can understand in the greater South African struggle history that, uh, as Mandy said earlier, that, you know, anyone passing on information to the state in those days was seen as an impimpi. And correctly so, I mean, the state was the enemy of the people. Uh, now the state, I'm not sure if it's <laughs> what it is. Um, uh, and so it's a, it's a different matter in a sense. Uh, the Ipimpi uh, stigma has remained in some areas. And, I, and I'll, I'll segue with that into Temba because Temba will understand the importance of just how deep that runs. But you know, not, none, of, none of the whistleblowers are Ipimpis. But, but Temba, the decision you made to leave must have been very hard for you. And you must have known it was going to be very cold outside of the party. And yet you still... Uh, a lot of whistleblowers are offered money or offered positions and accept those those gratuities because I think to the the fem, the, man, uh, the Gupta family the members we're speaking about here who have been spoken about at Zondo were not adverse to offering large amounts of cash and duffel bags apparently according to some testimony. Um, what what uh, what were the considerations you had to make knowing you would leave a well paid job as a DG almost the equivalent or more? Um, to take on, I think, a, 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 
a, a ruling party with whom you had grown up, I would imagine, or with whom you had an affinity and whom you worked for, it must have been uh, extremely painful. It, it was painful, but let me just start by saying that initially, I didn't see what I was doing as necessarily whistleblowing. I was defying the Gupta family and in an attempt, in the process, trying to defend the state. Secondly, I was defying Zuma, but I never went public when I did this. It's only much later when I realized that this is a much bigger project. There was more corruption taking place, more SOEs and, and government departments been taken over by this family. That's when I decided to speak out publicly. But I mean, are we talking about close to three years of me sitting with this pain inside of me of not being able to speak. When I took the decision to leave government, um, I was hoping maybe naively that the political party will take steps to stop this. And, and that's where my disappointment, my biggest disappointment uh, came from your, the NEC of the ANC, your parliament uh, defending what was taking place in the country. But I never expected um, the kind of cold shoulder I would get also from the private sector. I mean, applying for jobs and seeking employment just became a no-no. And I started understanding or tried to understand why that was the case. And it became very clear to me that in fact, the political elite, the ruling elite, in the case of the ANC, the strong affection at a particular point in time is almost feared uh, in the country, both inside the ruling party itself, but also in the, in, the, in the private sector because none of the companies wanted to be seen to be associated with somebody who exposed corruption of a leader who was part of a political party or the president or part of a, big, uh, of a strong faction uh, with, within the, the ruling party itself. So that was the bigger shocker. I never anticipated this. Um, I was hoping that I would also, you know, pursue entrepreneurial opportunities, become a business person. I tried a lot of business opportunities and went to financial institutions to seek for funding. And I was met with a cold shoulder from your, your government owned institutions, funding agencies, your banks. Nobody was prepared to even look at my application because I was told even before this notion of a, a PEP, a politically exposed person, before it had become popular in the country. I was told point blank by banks that in fact, I'm a politically exposed person. So my application will receive greater scrutiny and that greater scrutiny meant a decline or no response to a lot of my applications. So it's, it's things that you never anticipate. And I was saying, I tried to spend time explaining to these banks that Yes, my name is, a, is appearing in all the newspapers all over the place, but I'm there exposing corruption, exposing state capture. So although I'm politically exposed, but I was exposed for trying to do what was right for the country and the, the, the financial institutions did not want to see the difference. They just said, you're politically exposed. We see you as a potential threat and nobody was actually willing to, to touch end of my proposal. It's shocking. So, it's absolutely it's shocking. Was, it, was, it was something that I never really anticipated. Well, strangely enough, those very same banks seem to didn't notice when a lot of money left South Africa for Dubai. And they are now sort of claiming they had no idea. If you and I owe them 24 and 95 on our credit cards, then they phone us every day. Uh, and I think uh, um, Amandi mentioned earlier on, I think South Africa, or was it Assel, or I'm not sure even if it was, if it was Brent, about that there's something, uh, you know, business in South Africa also lacks ethics. There is something about mm -hmm. protecting your interests, protecting, uh, um, uh, but they don't realize in the long run, we had a similar situation, I think, um, around whistleblowing in the pensions, the, the 30 billion rand in unclaimed pensions, which was sitting with the, yeah. with the, with the various companies uh, who were, were administering it and, and earning interest. And uh, whistleblowers there, funnily enough, somebody phoned the, the, the corruption line and whoever took the call in the corruption line in the unnamed insurance company warned their bosses that there was mm. a whistleblower within the insurance company. Uh, yeah. and, and I think that's the terrible 
simple thing is that people make you collude through fear of loss of income, fear of uh, demotions or, or, or being threatened. And our constitution and people like yourself, member, and, and you, Ethel, you've gone, I hope you aren't being load shed. Uh, and Brent writing about it at Ground Up and helping young writers in Mandy to show society that actually this is the society we want. It is possible to be ethic ethical, but we do live in times where it's post-ideological and post-ethical. So uh, um, you're a rarity. Can I, can I just make one last point? I mean, when I, my story came out, when I eventually blew the whistle in the media, um, we, we spoke to a lot of officials, government officials, even at the level of DGs who had terrible stories to tell. And we even prepared a memorandum that was submitted to government, which I think played a key role in the establishment of the Zondo Commission. But part of the commitment we made was that we'll all come forward and make presentations to the Zondo Commission. But sadly, people had to think about their careers, their kids at school, their income, their cars, their bonds, their all kinds of things. And it became very difficult for them to actually come out in the open. And some of them just left the public service and were employed by the private sector because although they left for more or less the same reasons as me, but they never spoke up. So they ended up with cushy corner office jobs in, in the private sector. But it you, is real. I mean, the fear of loss of income, uh, in some cases, even threats of violence or killings and all of those kinds of things, those things are real in the country. And people do think twice before they, they actually come out. But the Zondo Commission, my view is actually started laying the foundation for people to be braver and take the risks. The important question is what sort of support mechanisms right. are put in place for people to actually come out more? Because you see the fear, the risk that we face is that the more and more people like myself speak out, but also talk about the impact of speaking out, it may actually scare quite a number of people to say, I don't want to go through what Temba went through. That experience is actually too harsh. And I think that's the, the challenge that we, as a country we face. We need to support people who really do come out. Marianne, if I can just jump in there very quickly, yes, sorry. Yes, um, a number of the whistleblowers I spoke to actually said that seeing Timber coming forward at the Zondo Commission, uh, him and people like Nkabisi Jonas coming forward, definitely gave them uh, the motivation to come forward and it was the catalyst. So, so Tim, it's important that you know that as well, is that people saw you coming forward with your story and thought, well, I've had this experience. And it's so important that, that we, as whistleblowers, you do come forward because it does encourage others and it mm -hmm. does give them the motivation. And when they see other people doing it, 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 it it's, it's often the catalyst. But the sad thing, as Athol says, is that everyone, we all love a whistleblower and we love us a good whistleblower because we feel they represent the good that is in us. But once they do so, I mean, I don't remember whether you've got any legal support, whether anybody came forward and offered, you know, once you've done it, uh, you, you actually, as, as I said, both of them, I think, didn't think about where this would go. And, it, it, you know, and you're helping shape new ways of doing it. But um, it's still not easy once you've made that decision. Look, I mean, it was a lonely journey uh, when I had to prepare all these affidavits to the public protector, to the Hawks, to... Zondo Commission and all of those kinds of things. I had to do that all by myself because I couldn't afford any legal representation. It was only closer to the Zondo Commission appearance that uh, two people I knew decided to volunteer their services. Uh, Tyrone Maseko and advocate of Azar Bam. And they provided legal support on a pro bono basis, which was truly appreciated. But other than that, you were on your own. And the, co the, costs are, the costs are crippling. We know there are many other people who um, have been pushed out in different places in, in, you know, in the, uh, the DPCI and other places have been ruined financially. Uh, I mean, yeah. the, the issue oh, of families, right? Families, the families. The oh, sorry, Tim. Mm. No, no, I was just saying that the loss of financial income, you'll see in my book, I talk about the fact that the last time I had a formal salary was somewhere in 2011. So between then and now, you just make ends meet. I was fortunate that I ended up joining some friends in some investment company and I was able to get some payment via that option. But as far as formal income was concerned, it was just a, a zero situation, which was the reason why the banks were refusing to provide any form of support. Because they were saying, you don't have income, so why should we even look at your personal loan or business loan? You've got no income, you haven't earned for so many years. So at a personal level, 
that hits you very hard. Brent, uh, um, uh, I wanted to just get your sense of, you, you know, you've written several works of non-fiction, which, which uh, there was a trilogy of them, uh, Five Lives at Noon, I don't know if that's the entire trilogy, where you looked at people's lives and lack of agency. And, and uh, 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 so you have a historical overview also, even though you've written this fiction about South Africa and the role of whistleblowers or people who, sp who spoke up then. Do you, and, and, and we also know that South African business, um, um, you know, uh, colluded with, with whichever government was in, in power. This is not anything new. Uh, there are many, it is now spoken about by certain groups of people as why WMC, and to a certain extent there is some truth in this, and which is why the, 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 the slogan is so seductive in a way. But as a journalist, having covered uh, politics for, for a, a very long time in South Africa, what, are your, what is your assessment of um, how we've handled the last 25 years and the fear, because I hear the word fear so much uh, in, in, in this conversation from, from everyone. Yeah, well, well, what 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 Temba came up against, of course, was the you know the, that you know big business and private corporations are deeply in bed with government, and if it's not just because they're doing a lot of business with government, uh, they also want to influence the regulations in their favour. So yes, a politically exposed person is 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 a liability and not an asset for them. Um, so that is a, that is a thing is that our big corporations are not necessarily interested in cleaner government, although they should be. Uh, but that's always been the case, and 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 those networks that were established, as we've you know we've seen uh, in excellent work that has been done in the last few years, you know those those connections that were established under the apartheid regime have actually in many ways continued to 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 exist and have have perpetuated. Uh, but I wanted to bring it down as as we always do at ground up, because um, we we're flying very high and very important stuff on on. But you know, even just whistleblowing on 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 the ground level, which affects a lot of people's ordinary lives. So we at ground up, you know, we cannot you, you cannot get a school principal to speak to you on the record or a doctor in a hospital, um, no matter what is going on in those places, to blow the whistle or to or, or even just to answer pretty ordinary questions which are in the public interest like you know well how many COVID patients do you have or whatever it is you know and they and they won't speak to us because they've all signed these government contracts which have got a, a standard clause which is a confidentiality one and it seems that if they criticize their employers in any way it's considered irresponsible now I, I, I you know maybe Mandy can come in here as well is that I mean I mean, surely that is unconstitutional, those confidentiality clauses, and don't they need to be tested? Um, that why are school principals, doctors, ordinary people, anybody employed by government, so that they cannot speak to the media, they cannot even give us a comment, it has to be referred to the spokesperson, um, where the narrative gets controlled, uh, because they are going to get into terrible trouble with their employers. Um, and then I've, just another thing that we tell people, and I want to know whether the other panelists think, especially uh, Mandy uh, and Temba Athel, uh, whether you think this is utterly naive. Uh, but we often say to, to whistleblowers, you know, the more you expose and the more open you make the information, the less likely you are. To, to, to come to harm. If you've put everything out in the public domain and you've got nothing else left to say, and it's all there and it's been testified and it's out, um, unless people are particularly vindictive and, 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 uh, and, and malicious, uh, isn't, isn't exposure and ex putting things in the light maybe your best protection? Mandy, if you want to pick that up, uh, has that been the case for the people you've interviewed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think that uh, often the view is that sunlight is the best disinfectant um, and the more you come out, but, but there still remains this element of, of, of fear because there, there is vengeance. Um, a number of the whistleblowers uh, do so anonymously. I write uh, in my book about a whistleblower on ETOLs who, who did it anonymously and today is living a perfectly fine life because nobody knows about him. The, the Gupta Leaks whistleblowers remain anonymous, but they are still very concerned about, uh, Marianne, as you would know, about any kind of vendetta or any kind of threat against them. Um, so it's difficult to just move on. I think people still ha have enormous concerns about the uh, state apparatus and what can be used against them. Uh, as we all know, crime intelligence was captured, the NIA was captured, 
uh, state security, uh, you know, output the whole lot. Um, and for that reason, I think people were just absolutely terrified about coming forward. Um, and, and, and it is concerning for people because they, they are so fearful of, of coming forward because of the repercussions. And, and often it's well, where do you go to? So a number of the people that blew the whistle during said capture, and Temba, you'll know this as well, they said, well, what do you do if your minister's captured? What do you do if the board is captured? Who do you go to? Um, you know, a lot of people went to the public protector, it took a long time for anything to, to get done. You go to the police, the police are captured, uh, which leaves the question of like, well, who do I tell? And that's why it took so many state capture whistleblowers a very long time to, to come forward because they were mulling this. They were like, well, can I tell this person? What will happen to me? What will happen to my family? Um, and that's why there is this element of fear underpinning coming forward for, for a lot of people. I have, uh, we've, we, we have, we've uh, got a little bit of time left. There's some questions coming in. I'd like to just ask, uh, there are two here from uh, uh, Johan van Lachenberg, who many people will know, has written several books of his own, was an executive at SARS, Driven Out. Uh, his first question, which I think we touched on earlier, but uh, it's just, it, it, it's, it's more nuanced, is uh, uh, what are your views regarding the current state of Protected Disclosures Act and what can be done to update and modernize it? I'm not sure if anybody here has some suggestions on that uh, coming from where you are? So I'm spoken about it already. So if anybody else yes, wants to yeah, jump yeah, in, yeah, feel, yeah. feel free. But there, there are definitely things we can look at. And I gave a copy of, of my book to, to the Justice Minister um, because I feel strongly that we need to uh, to change the, the legislation here. And there, there are options that can be looked at. I don't know if anything is currently being done at all. Okay. Which well, one well, idea? Yes. Sorry, Marianne, just just one idea. You know, we, we talk we talk a lot about um, needing to protect whistleblowers. Um, we, we, we really talk about punishing those who are causing the whistleblowers the distress, right? So Temba talks about having gone to the banks. Well, there's only six or seven banks in our country, so we know who they are. Um, so why is there no repercussions for them? Um, right, the threats I'm facing, there's absolutely no repercussions. There are no legal repercussions for a company to be threatening a whistleblower in their employ. So I think those are some of the things the PDA does have to deal with. Um, I, you know, my story, I was part-time at Bain, part-time at UCT, right? That, that was my arrangement. Um, UCT asked me to resign after I blew the whistle. And, and so I'm caught in a massive struggle with UCT now. Um, so we can talk about the, the costs whistleblowers face, but we don't hold these institutions um, accountable. So of course they're going to keep going. The fact that UCT would punish a whistleblower, um, and I think a lot of companies punish the whistleblowers. Yeah. Um, I've said to UCT, they are setting back justice in our country by punishing me as a whistleblower. And they've got no interest in it because there's no consequence for them. So I think was, there, was there a response just that this is your problem, you've created it, we can't be here, we don't have the infrastructure, time or budget yep. To, yep. to deal with it? Simple as that. You're not, just bottom you're line, not doing your job. Fixing. Yeah, you're not, you're not doing your job, and so therefore you must leave. And um, we don't value you enough, or I'm not saying that's what UCT said, but you know, you'd think that you would value an employee who arrives with those kind of values. Well, absolutely, absolutely, Marianne. I mean, the irony was I was a business ethics lecturer at UCT trying to teach business leaders about you know, making ethical decisions. There I was actually walking the talk of what I was teaching, um, and, and they just saw no value in that. Um, so, but, but, so again, I say, but th these are hidden people. These are public, you know, we can name the banks, we can name the corporations, okay. I'm naming UCT. But I'm told with these consequences for them, this whole talk about protecting and caring for whistleblowers for me is a, one side of it. Um, but if, if I as a company don't feel accountable for acting ethically towards whistleblowers, there'll be no, no change either. Oh, so if, if you look at the research that I referenced a little bit earlier on this project, um, Global Accountability Project report that came out last week, it actually case studies the South African examples of remuneration and uh, what happened to the corporates involved and in which instances they had to pay the whistleblower uh, following court judgments. And it's ridiculous. It's actually, it's like there's like five court cases where um, they've actually been held accountable, the, the corporates. And this is mm. one of the problems with the PDA is that there's no accountability, there's no implementation, um, there's, there's no any kind of, of accountability uh, on, on behalf of the corporates. And, and that's one of the fundamental problems. 
Well, this leads into the question that a second question Johan has asked, which is that the effects on, uh, uh, you know, on family and real are, are, and, and close pe uh, people close to, to, to whistleblowers are real and permanent. Uh, elsewhere in the world, there are civil society bodies that support whistleblowers. In South Africa, we, we, we appear thin on such support. What can be done about this? With who? Or rather, where in government is ownership vested? So I think, in a sense, uh, you know, that is the case. Where if, uh, I think all of these corporates with them, there isn't a single mind behind corporations or big, uh, you know, global companies, but they care more about the brand than anything else, and that's where uh, citizens and people have the power is 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 in deciding that uh, on mass that we will you know either protest the brand or boycott the brand because i know in the case of the the pensions that were withheld the the insurance company very quickly once it was written about uh backtracked and started to to do some work and so one feels okay you've done something there um that question then civil society and its role uh does that help any of you timber let's start with you You just need to slightly unmute, unless you're not ready to answer that. <laughs> I, I write quite a bit about it in, in, the, in the book. Uh, but um, look, I think that many in her book does give a, an outline of uh, the current legal environment. And I think that it's something that needs to be studied. I really think that um, there's got to be stronger civil society participation. I think that civil society can play a much stronger role in making sure that they, there's enough lobbying to change the legislation, but also work that needs to be done to support families of whistleblowers. I mean, we're talking about cases of people, for example, losing their jobs, taking their kids out of school. I mean, worse examples of whistleblowers being killed uh, with no support being provided to their families. So the impact on families beyond just whistleblowers is actually quite huge. And I think that um, we, we can't expect government to be playing that role. It must contribute financially to some kind of process. But for government to take charge of that process, I think will not give people enough confidence because remember the real issue is that a lot of the complaints are gonna be about government. You can't have private sector playing a leading role there because there will also be a lot of complaints or whistle blowing about what's happening in the private sector. So if private sector is in charge, it will actually discourage people to go and talk to those uh, institutions. So civil society or some kind of parastatal organization is established given resources by both public and private sectors because they, the leadership of the public and private sectors need to demonstrate commitment to fight corruption, to expose state capture, but also support those who are willing to actually speak out. And I think that an independent structure could actually play a much more stronger role to protect, support whistleblowers, but also something is done to support the families of those who have blown the whistle. I just wanted to mention to everybody, your book's title is a beautiful title called For My Country. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, we didn't mention that earlier on. I think it's an absolutely beautiful title and I really look forward to it. Uh, Brent, I just wanted to move to you and talk about truth telling, uh, because that's in a sense uh, what whistleblowers do. But we do know we live in a world which I think Kellyanne Conway was the first to use the word of alternative facts. Uh, and you said this much earlier on in this webinar that people have a very strange relationship with the truth. And here we are dealing with people who are telling the truth and yet we as society want it. But when it happens, we seem to all run away because we're cowards. I don't, it's a difficult question. I don't know if you, if you have any thoughts on, on what you've seen in terms of um, smaller whistleblowers down on the ground and elsewhere about truth telling and how people will construct the truth and tell you basically, that, you know, a government is doing something in a particular way because that, you know, that these people are, uh, the Guptas are here, they're uh, a new business, they're a patriotic business family, and you eventually start buying the lie that actually, yes, we're on a mission here, we're on a political project to oust, uh, you know, a, 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 an embedded financial sector and be bringing in new investors and these are the, are the Guptas. I mean, Vincent Smith said something really Really interesting in his testimony and I found his testimony um, very moving because he he explained to Judge Zonda what happened to the ANC when people returned was 
uh, there was a discussion amongst the party that we're looking for patriotic business. You know, that's what we want. We want people who support the, gov support the government, who are going to help our initiatives. We've got this broad vision. Uh, you know, we know what our policies are as the ruling party. And so when you're in it, as Temba says, you're not quite sure. So, you know, Vincent said, well, when Bosasa came around, I thought, hey, the Watsons are cool. They're supporting uh, their patriotic business. And you realize how the lines blur. Uh, how do we counter uh, the other the social platforms that exist where, uh, you know, truths, lies can be, you know, uh, uttered uh, until they become truth in some people's minds? And what role is the media playing there, too? Well, I mean, yeah, well, the, the quit, uh, you know, ironically, I, you know, people always ask, well, you know, do we trust the media? And, and, and I would sort of reply, well, not when it's been drinking. Um, but, the, but the media certainly uh, is, is trusted in the sense that even when we get it wrong, um, uh, what we say is, is, is rapidly repeated, uh, or, you know, by everybody. So there must be some level of trust uh, uh, out there in, in the public. But I, th I think the I think the important thing here is that when we're talking about you're talking about the fake news and about controlling the narratives and about this political spin, this is why it has become so important for certain elements in this country to want to capture the media, because that is the way you do it. So that is a, you know that is the big uh, the, the the big thing we've got to watch out for is that the media do, does keep on telling the truth and it does have the independence and the ability to stand up against these kind of forces that we are discussing, which is exactly why the media was targeted. I mean, at a time when uh, parliament was not exercising its uh, executive oversight, when the national you know, prosecuting authority was paralyzed, uh, when the uh, public protector was unintelligible, uh, when the, uh, the, uh, the law enforcement agencies uh, had been captured, I mean, all we had to rely on was that exposure that came out, like the Gupta leaks, the enormous uh, momentum that that produced, the public outrage that that built to, which eventually, you know, goaded our moribund organs of state into some kind of action. So we mustn't lose sight of that. We're talking about certainly strengthening the legislation. We're certainly, you know, talking about that. We're certainly talking about supporting uh, whistleblowers and developing uh, the uh, uh, support for them in civil society, but we mustn't take our eye off the ball. What we've got to get back is our intelligence services, our prosecuting authority, our public protector, and all these other bodies to do their job and to do them with the independence as outlined in the constitution. And that, that is how you, you know, protect a whistleblower ultimate, ultimately. And also for you know, people like Tenda Maseko in government, you know, professionals who know their mandate, who know the legislation, who know the rules and know the law, where you don't overstep, where you know, there, are, there are checks and balances already in procurement and you know, PFMA. We have laws that are there. It's just that uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people just don't understand them, don't, uh, uh, are told to ignore them. Uh, and, and, and the fear factor to me is something that I, I find quite worrying and, and it's been worrying for a very long time. We've, you know, we, th this country is ridden with fear from crime through to, you know, uh, exposing high level elites. And I'm talking business elites, starting with them, and then the banks and then, and then government itself. We've gone a little bit over time. I'm going to allow us another five minutes. And I, I'm not sure if I've covered um, everything uh, that, those of you who are in the thick of this feel needs to be spoken about, needs to be covered in this particular forum. So if you have anything I haven't touched on that you feel you'd like to say, um, we can perhaps end off with, with, uh, with all of you kind of, uh, as all you are, you know, it's, it's going to be a long testifying for you coming up. And, and Timber, I, 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 you have testified already. I'm trying to remember whether you have testified. I've testified thrice already, but I'm still right. under threat to be called as, as a witness if somebody wants to interrogate me. I don't think they will, but let's leave it at that. I think they're busy. <laughs> they're having tea, whoever wants to interrogate you. Sorry. Uh, but uh, you know, if anybody else, I don't know, Mandy, uh, I'll come back to the two of you. Mandy, have you, have you, have you got some closing words around uh, just, I think you said something very important that we need to create a whistleblowing culture and support for whistleblowers and for us as the public to own them. And they are heroes. I keep on thinking we should put up a statue outside parliament to the unnamed whistleblower. Uh, if people don't like the general outside parliament, uh, we can just change him to the unnamed whistleblower. No, says, no, says Ethel. Why not? Uh, I, I don't want us to caricature whistleblowers. 
because then it feels like, okay, we've done our job. We've recognized whistleblowers and we can move on. I'm very seriously worried that we just ignore the perpetrators, which are all the enablers of, 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 of corruption. So, you know, because we'll end this call and tomorrow we'll go and say, wow, look at that great CEO, that great leader in our country. But these are the very people who are punishing whistleblowers. And so I, um, we can put up the statue. Let me not poo poo that idea. It's it just, I want us to take, to take seriously this issue we face in our country. I tell you my take on it, Marianne, I think this, our lack of interest in supporting whistleblowers is consistent with our, with our weak social cohesion in our country. We treat our whistleblowers differently to be, to the way we treat the poor, the way we, the way we treat women who have suffered gender-based violence, the way we treat um, activists, or, or anti-apartheid activists who are in the shadows. So there is, a, there is a, a deeper difficulty in our country of not really caring for each other, right? We all walk past someone lying in the street and kind of think, oh, he's probably drunk or whatever it is. And so that's been my experience of it, that it's, I'm not a pointed government, uh, partly as, as Brent was saying, just have these singular ideas. It's state capture happened because of its network effect, not just because of Zuma, right? The, 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 those complicit go to the JSE and go down the list and confident to tick every one of them and keep going because they were all complicit in this. And the same people who were complicit in state capture are now complicit in the cover-up and, and punishing those who do speak up. And I think until we are serious about addressing some of that as well, I don't think we make much progress. Okay. I think load shedding has, has taken um, uh, Mandy off, off the grid. She's gone back. Uh, Timber, if you have some final words for us, uh, perhaps that you, you, you know, where you'd like to sum up. I mean, it's been a hell of a ride for you. Thank you for what you did. Um, you're an example to all of us. You do. You make us all braver. You really do. You know. I mean, I wish we could all just, you know, go rob a bank and give it to you, but we can't. That would be illegal. Timba. No, thanks for the opportunity. I think that um, writing the book, I want to bring it back to that, was an opportunity for me to reflect uh, on what I did, why I did it, and also explaining and encouraging more people to actually uh, come out and, and, and expose. The, the rot that's happening both in the public and private sectors. Um, and also want to take the opportunity. I mean, I didn't, in this conversation, I didn't say much about the important role that media has played. And I think it's been mentioned. I'm glad it has been mentioned here because in my book, I do mention the media because without the media, a lot of what we're talking about today would not actually be, be taking place. And I fully concur with the view that we should also not just talk about whistleblowers, but also talk about those who enable state capture, corruption to take place in the country and actually make sure that people are held accountable. Individuals, politicians, businesses, companies, everybody must be held accountable for what has happened in the country. So with those few words, uh, thank you very much for the thank opportunity you. this evening. Thank you. Uh, just before I get to you, Brent, and I think we have lost uh, uh, Mandy to state capture perhaps. Um, there you are, Mandy. We thought we'd lost you to ESCOM and state capture, but she's connecting to audio. Mandy, you're welcome. You're back. Uh, the, um, Brent, uh, um, some last words about uh, what this means. I think the Zonda Commission has taught South Africans to watch every day. Uh, many of us do. We're addicted to it. Many of us are not. I look at the South Africans talking to each other on the side, but they're not fighting and insulting with each other. They're fabulous. You know, that's what we are. We're lovely people, and but when we get cross, we kill each other. You know what I mean? But um, the Zonda Commission has also enabled us to understand and see the law, how it works in a very unique and extraordinary way, which we not haven't measured yet, in how it has people, you know, hearing me tell you that a politician has done something or a businessman has done something, you can point at me and say, you're the media, you're lying, you're white monopoly capital, or you've got an interest. But to hear it from people themselves within government has been extremely painful, and I think has led to a understanding that we have this extraordinary uh, country, this extraordinary constitution. We've got whistle. We've got incredible people. The media. So there's a lot to be very grateful for and happy for. But it is under threat. Um, so Brent, if you just wanted to sum up for all of us before I thank the sponsors, um, uh, ten of them, uh, who we also need very much. People who sponsor these kind of events, we really are very, very grateful to you. Uh, because platforms are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And all of you, please, if you can offer any support, Assol's bank account number is on his Facebook page. <laughs> I loved it that you did that. You were just like, okay, you want to help me? Here it goes. I need airtime, you know, and, and uh, 
we'll find a way. We'll find a way. Bryn. Yeah, well, I'm not, not going to sum up. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, that's supposed to be my job. I'm just going to say, yeah, but I think that the, the, the Zondo Commission has been quite remarkable. And it is, again, it, it's, it's our latest, it's, it's the kind of the truth commission uh, after 27 years of, 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 of democracy, in a way. And, and it's an, it is an opportunity to us to look at exactly what, you know, what has happened in our country. And I think it's stood up so far. I think it has stood up very, very well. Um, but we're going to have to see how this plays out. Um, and of course, it's completely dependent upon all those other institutions that I that I that I mentioned before. But certainly, that you know, that the, 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 there's a lot has come to light, um, and it has shone a very strong light. And 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 I think we're going to be unpacking it for 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 quite some time after this, just as we had to do with the with the TRC as well. And and then we'll also reflect on its shortfallings and what it didn't get right and you know and we'll be able to develop that and strengthen the democracy this is all that these there is a lot of good stuff going on um and my, my last word is to say i love hearing from whistleblowers so cool. you can always contact us Brent, brent's available at uh, me too although at the moment I've, I've got a bit of a technology problem someone came into my house and took my computers we won't mention who uh we don't know who but they wore gloves um uh, I thank you very much to all of you for the work that you do for being here this evening. Thank, to, thank you to all the participants who attended this, uh, this uh, dinner table seminar. They were meat and potatoes. You can go make your own pudding. There isn't any at the moment. The pudding maybe is for me to just thank the sponsors uh, for making this possible, the University of KZN. Uh, some of them I can't read my own handwriting. Uh, <laughs> the Department of Arts and Culture. Uh, the KZN Departments of Alt Arts and Culture, Foundation for Human Rights, the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences, Amanzi Museum, uh, Media in Biza, Journal of, uh, I can't remember, but can't see my handwriting there, and Hear My Voice, who is an NPO who have hosted this after this, this, this so wonderfully hosted this evening. Thank you to all of the team there uh, for making this go so smoothly, and we don't want to thank ESCOM for anything, so we won't. Um, Enjoy the rest of the festival. We look forward to your books. Ethel, I would recommend people buy uh, all, all of the authors here will enrich your life and bring you nuanced uh, perspectives on and, and, and our, our, our wide ranging subjects. So thank you to all um, and go well. And we will all connect soon, I'm sure, very soon. So thank you. Thanks to everybody. Good night. Thank you.